We'll keep that on tape and see what actually happens. The Work and Pension Secretary, Ian Duncan Smith, is a man on a mission. He's undertaken the biggest overhaul of our welfare state since, well, since the welfare state was invented way back in the black and white days of the late 1940s. A committed Roman Catholic, he said he has a moral vision to reverse the previous welfare system that he believes didn't create enough incentive for people to work. But are his reforms working? Are they fair? Has he bitten off more than he can chew? In a moment, we'll be speaking to the man himself. But first, here's our Adam. Adam. Hackney in North London. And we're on the road with a man who might just be the most ambitious welfare secretary there's ever been. It's a journey that started in the wind and rain on a Glasgow council estate 12 years ago when he was Tory leader. He came face to face with what it meant to be poor. A collection of teddy bears. <laughs> Oh, it's where he discovered his recipe for reform, according to one of the advisers who was with him. There are things that if you do, get a job, keep your family together, stay off drugs and alcohol, make sure you have a proper skill, that's what gets you off poverty. And he incredibly ambitiously wants to redefine the nature of what it is to be poor and how you get away from poverty. Can I sit down here? Yeah, take a seat. Great. Back in North London, IDS has come to congratulate the troops on some good news. In this borough, the number of people on job seekers allowance has gone down by 29% in the last year, from around 1,700 to around 1,200. But the picture on his wider changes to the welfare state is a bit more mixed. A cap on the total amount of benefits a family can get of £26,000 a year is hugely popular, but there have been howls of protest over cuts to housing benefits, labelled the bedroom tax by some. Protests too about assessments for people on disability benefits inherited from the previous government. IDS has been accused of being heartless and the company doing them, Atos, has pulled out. And then there's the biggie, universal credit, a plan to roll six benefits into one monthly payment in a way designed to ensure that work always pays. Some of the IT has been written off and the timetable seems to be slipping. Outside the bubble of the stage-managed ministerial trip, the local Labour MP reckons he's bitten off more than he can chew. The great desire is to say, you know, let's have one simple approach, one size will fit all, and the reality is, you know, there isn't one size of person or family out there. People are different, their needs change, and they can change on the turn of a penny almost. So that one minute the people are doing absolutely the right thing, working hard, the next minute they need a level of support that they need to, to have at that moment. And if uh, the simple system doesn't deliver that for them, then they're in a really difficult position. And that's the flying visit to the front line finished. Watching IDS, his determination is obvious. He does not like to hang about. And just as well, his overhaul of the entire benefit system still has quite a long way to go. And Ian Duncan Smith joins me now. Welcome to the Sunday Politics. Andrew. Before I come on to the substance of our yep. interview on welfare reform, mm. is Danny Alexander right when he claims that the Lib Dems had to fight tooth and nail to get the Tories to agree to raise the income tax threshold? Well, uh, to be fair, that's not my recollection of what actually happened. I understand that uh, these were discussions and debates that took place in the coalition. I mean, after all, the Conservatives are in favour and came into this election, last election, in favour of reducing the overall burden of taxation. Uh, so the question really was, how best did we do it? So the discussion took place. Uh, they were very keen for it to be done at raising the thresholds. There were other debates about whether you actually raise the, the lower rate of income tax. So there's a balance of where you do it. Uh, but it was clear from the Conservatives that we always wanted to improve the quality of life for those at the bottom end, so uh, raising the thresholds fit within the overall plan. So there, if it was a row, it was the kind of row you have over a cup of tea around a breakfast table, row if you know what I mean, and then you all agree and pat each other on the back and move on. But maybe that's a big row for the Liberal Democrats, I'm not sure. All right. Now you're enacting the biggest <coughs> reform of the welfare state in a generation. We've got a lot to cover. Yeah. There are two main criticisms of what you're doing. One, will they work? And secondly, are the changes fair? Let's start yeah. with the first, with will yeah, they work? Indeed. Leslie Roberts, one of our viewers, contacted us on Facebook. She wants to know why so much has already been <clears> written <throat> off uh, due to failures of the universal credit system, even though it's barely been introduced. Why have we had to spend all this money? 
Uh, well, actually, there hasn't been. I mean, relatively to it's an over £2 billion investment project in the private sector, uh, IT programs write off regularly 30 40% because that's the nature. Now, the point I want to make here is that universal credit's already rolling out. The IT is working. Uh, we're improving it as we go along. And the reality with all programs to do with IT, the key thing is you keep your eye on the bits that don't work and you make sure they don't actually create a problem for the program. But and you've so written that's exactly off 140 million. No, no, we haven't. Uh, the write off. Public is, accounts can no, 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 no. The right off. 40 is, million be no, wasted. No, no, there's two things. The, the, the 40 million that was written off was to do with security IT that I actually took the decision over a year and a half ago. And so the program continued to roll out. What, your, uh, what those figures include is what is the standard uh, write down, which is the amortization of cost over a period of time, which you do. For example, the existing legacy system computers, uh, they were written down in cost terms in the accounts <coughs> years ago, but they continue to work right now to reduce benefit changes. So it's, it's, uh, it's a reality that universal credit is rolling out. We're doing the pathfinders. We're learning a lot about it. But I'm not going to ever do this again like the last government did, which is you do big bang launches and then you have problems like they have with the health IT and it crashes. You do it phase by phase. You learn what you have to do. You make the changes right. and then you continue to get the but, uh, rest of it right. But even your conservative <coughs> cabinet colleague, Francis Maud, says the implementation of universal <coughs> credit has been, quote, pretty lamentable. He was referring back to the time when I actually stopped that particular element of the process. With and I agreed watch. with him. But I agreed with him under that. And I actually was the one that intervened to make yes. the changes. But the, the key point here is, uh, and this is very important, Andrew, it is rolling out. Uh, I invite anybody uh, from the media, etc., to come and look at where it's being rolled well, out Well, you to. say it's been rolling it's out, but, but almost no one <coughs> can notice the rolling out. I mean, you were predicting that a million people would be on universal credit. Mm. This is the new welfare credit, yeah. which rolls up six existing welfare benefits. That's right, yeah. Uh, and you were predicting a million people would be on it by April. Well, it's March, and only 3,200 are on it. No, well, I'm not going to bandy figures around, it's over 6,000 rising. The point is... 6,000 then, I'll give you 6,000. Uh, but it's in the Pathfinder. The point is, I changed the way we would roll it out over a year and a half ago, and there was a reason for that. Under the advice of somebody I brought in from outside, he said, you're better pathfinding this out, making sure you learn the lessons, roll it out slower, and then you gain momentum later on. Actually, on the timetables for the rollout, we're very clear that pretty much it's, it's going to roll out within the timescales originally set, but the, the scale of that rolls out. So what we're going to do is roll it out into the northwest so that we replicate the UK and the North West, recognise how it works properly, and then you roll it out region by region, you which is a hit, much better way to do you it. You won't hit a million by April, let's be honest. Uh, no, 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 I've, I've no intention of trying to pretend that well, we will. Where? But that's quite deliberate. Andrew, I will not because it would be the wrong thing to do. I recognise that two years ago we want to roll it out carefully so that we make sure that everything about it works. There are lots of variations and variables in this process, but if you do it that way, you won't end up with the kind of debacle that last government had on the health service and many others, where they wrote off something in the order of £28 billion pounds of IT right. programmes. We won't be doing that. Well, process will get it so that it's delivered, and the important point is there's £38 billion pounds of net benefits, which is exactly what the NAO said, so it's worth getting it right. William Grant tweeted as he goes by the name of at uh, Maury <coughs> Golfer. He wants to know, when will the universal credit actually be universal? When will it cover the whole country? Uh, by 2016, everybody who is claiming a benefit in those six benefits will actually be claiming a universal credit benefit. But not everybody plan. will be getting it by then. Well, because there are those who are already on, in one particular case, say for some of those on sickness benefits, where they'll take longer to bring on, because it's a little more problematic with them. It's a bit more difficult because many of them have no work expectations on them. But for those who are actually on things like uh, present tax, uh, uh, working tax credits, on things like uh, job seekers allowance, on all the benefits, they, they will be making claims on universal credit. Many of them are already doing that now. There are over 200,000 people around the country who are already on parts of universal credit now and there will be more. But you can't so it's a slow a, and you careful You can't give me a date as when everybody will be on UC. Oh, we said that they'd be on UC uh, by the two th uh, 2018. But the reality and is... And are you on track for that? Yes, we are. But my reality is... Eight years it's taken. It, 2016 is when everybody claiming this benefit will be on. Then you have to bring those who have been on a long time on other benefits. Right. Take them slow. But can I just make this one point? It's quite important. Universal credit is 
a big and important reform. It's not an IT reform. IT is only the automation. The important point is it'll be a massive cultural reform. Just give me one example of this, which is why it's so important. Right now, if somebody has to go to work and there's a small mini job out there, they won't take that because the way their benefits are withdrawn, it will mean it's not worth doing. Under where we've got it in the Pathfinders, they'll all tell you it, the change is dramatic. You can get a job seeker to take a small part-time job immediately while they're looking for work. Right. That improves their likelihood of getting longer work and it means flexibility right. for business. So I'm, it's a big, big change. Right. It's I'm worth getting ca that, careful. Because let's just see if that's true. Because universal mm. credit is meant to make work pay. That is yeah. your mantra. Let me just show you a quote from the Prime Minister when he was then last Tory Corcoran's leader of the opposition. 30 years ago, this party, the Tories, won an election fighting against 98% <clears throat> tax rates on the richest. Today, I want us to show even more anger about the 96% tax rates on the poorest. Right. Yeah. That's the situation. But under universal, that one, yeah. under universal credit, the marginal tax rate can still be 76%. It's only come down from 96 to 76%. Uh, no, actually, for lone parents... Uh, that would, it would be 76% if they were in the tax bracket. Uh, actually, before they get to the tax bracket, it's well below that. And, of course, governments can change and vary that. That's a decision that a government takes about what's called uh, the withdrawal rate. So you oh. could lower the withdrawal rate or raise you're it. Not, you're not choosing to. The fact is that under your reforms, some of the poorest people in this land, if they earn an no. extra pound... No. No. will pay a marginal yeah. rate of 76%. Andrew, some of the poorest people in this land will pay over 100% back in some cases under the present system. The 98% he's talking about is a specific area to do with lone parents. But there are some compound processes inside the present benefit system that mean people are worse off going into work than staying out sure. of work. So they will, this will make a big difference. They will be better off. More importantly, they will be able to identify by how much they're better off without having to have a maths degree to figure it out. Because all, at the moment, all the benefits are taken away at different rates. Some are gross, some are net. Sure. It's complex, it's chaotic. Under universal credit, that won't happen. It'll be simple, and they will always be better off than they are now under universal Would credit. Would you work that bit harder if the government was going to take away 75 pence of every extra pound you earned? It's not. It would be higher than that under the present system, much higher. Yeah, but in some it's still cases, going to, I know that. But so, uh, my point is that at the moment you're going to tax poor people at the same rate that the French socialist government taxes billionaires. Yeah. Millions will be better off under the, present, under the system of universal credit, I promise you, and better off that they notice it. And, of course, the point I make to you is that that level of withdrawal then becomes something that governments have to publicly discuss as to whether they lower it or they raise it, well, depending George, on the state of the economy. I understand that, but George Osborne wouldn't give you the extra money to allow for a... Uh, less deep taper. Well, That's the right. key thing is both the taper and also the participation point. In other words, the moment somebody crosses into work, under the present system, which you haven't talked about yet, there are huge cliff edges to getting into work. In other words, the immediate withdrawal for that makes it worse for them to go into work than otherwise. These have come right down. But if he had given you more money, you could have tapered it more gently. The point I make is there are two Correct. elements of calculation here. The first is the withdrawal rate Take on the marginal point. rate. He could have. If you had got oh, more course, money, a, a, a you could have more of You've course, got a lot of running. Of course, Andrew, but a Chancellor can always ultimately make that decision. These are not fixed in concrete. These are decisions that are made by Chancellors, depending, again, like tax rates, how they then judge it. But it'll be much easier under this system for the public to see what that Chancellor, what the government chooses as its priorities. At the moment, nobody has any idea what those rates are and right. benefits. But in future, but it will be. And can I just say, under the Pathfinders, we are finding people are going to work faster they're doing more job searches and they're more likely to take work under universal credit in the Pathfinders. Let's look at the work programme.